Hello everyone. So of course I've not done a, a review in about a month or so now. Uh, probably a bit longer than that actually. Just wanted to take a little bit of a break from reviews. Some health stuff came up. Uh, I went on a trip to Wales and I've been doing a lot more writing as well. Really trying to focus in on that. Uh, got my first sale and it's my third published story. So I've really been trying to focus on that. Anyway. So this is Adam Neville's Some Will Not Sleep, Selected Horrors. Now, Adam Neville is a, he's mostly known for writing novels. He's quite prolific, actually. Uh, English. And some, I read a review that said his shorts are better than his novels. I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's an opinion that's broadly shared or not. But anyway, I just, uh, since I wanted to read shorts, I got this. I got this. Um, evocative cover, it's got that black metal feeling to it and I believe uh, Neville is a fan of black metal and industrial and sort of heavier styles of music. Um, I'll say first of all I definitely re recommend the book. I'll say however that the first two stories I did not... I was a little bit disappointed by them. The reason that is is because the first story Where Angels Come In felt very standard and cliche to me. Um, I was telling somebody that it feels almost like there's no subtext. Now, I have to stress that there's a lot of good stuff in here, but first of all, I'll just start off with some, some of the weaker stories. It gets better quite quickly. Where Angels Come In, it's about these two kids that go into an abandoned, haunted house, and really that's where it sort of goes, and it's it, there's not much more to it than that. And if I've missed something, I'm sure, I'm sure I have. But... Uh, it feels like it's a little bit cliche. We have these weird sort of old women in this old house, and that's kind of where it seems to just land. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. The atmosphere is good. I really enjoyed the, this feeling of uh, it's got that sort of classic horror vibe to it, where these kids are, in, are sort of daring themselves to go past the gate in summertime to to, to this haunted house on a hill. But see, things seem to become just sort of weird for weirdness sake and there's a few of those stories like that in this collection where it just sort of ends flat for me. I've sort of certainly done more of a meaning to it and there's a lot of good stories with meaning to them eventually uh, but I just did not feel like the first story was any was as good as the other ones. The original occupant as well was much better. It's a, it's a good solid story. It's about this haunted house again sort of cabin uh, in the Swedish wilderness believe in Swedish wilderness. Now I should say because of various issues and, and other things I've been getting getting on with, I took me a while to read this so some of the details are a little bit hazy. Um, saying that, um, it's really this, I'll just read this little thing here. So basically it's about a man who's listening to another man's story of how their mutual friend went crazy in a Swedish cabin in the wilderness. And that's where the story really kicks off from. Um, it's, I really enjoyed the start. It's just that the end seems to be it's a monster story, and I'm not. I don't really connect with those. And the ending just seems. Like, it's just a typical monster story. Monster story for me. And I didn't really have much going for it. I, I re, I'm really enjoying these stories nowadays, where it's like Cisco. Um, and some some of Tosa's stories, definitely some of uh, of course like Legotti, you know. The more the ones that are, have more subtext to them and feel weird, like dogs, like um, I can't remember the name. One of the stories in Cisco, but it's just dog scream, and it just seems weird and has something more to it. It feels like it's art. Not to say that there's a lot of good stuff in here, but um, yeah, I feel like I feel like that one there is just a little bit standard in a way, a monster story in a, in a cabin in the woods in the wilderness. However. Mother's Milk, the third story. Now this Mother's Milk, I actually need to go, there's some notes at the back that I've not read yet. Um, that ne Neville seems to have gone into some detail to describe his th thoughts on the story, so I should, probably should read those actually, I'll probably do those tonight. Mother's Milk, however, I wonder if that's actually been inspired or vice versa by um, Cisco's story. I can't remember the title again, it was quite a while ago, but it's the one that, uh, it's got. I think it's got milk in the title. Um, and it seems to be quite similar in a way. It's definitely got that weird, weird vibe to it. I love this story. It's really good. Um, I think the ending uh, was suitably weird. I'm not sure if I completely connected with it. I, I have this. I have trouble sometimes connecting with the endings of stories, and it just 
maybe it's some sort of fatigue from all the I mean I'm constantly writing my own stuff and then critiquing other people's work as well that's it's not an excuse well it's kind of an excuse but basically I'm trying to say I didn't understand some of these stories but maybe obviously they weren't a second or a third reading um, this is a weird one I'm gonna actually this is just to save on time I sort of skip the excerpts for uh, the first two but listen to this first page for the mother's milk Exiled like a degenerate king on a cardboard throne, Saul sleeps down here in the gloom, same time every day, all seven feet of his bulk rest. Thick limbs splay amongst the boxes and acres of bubble wrap, his big head is thrown back in making strangled sounds. There is a moon of a face above a neck teared with fat, luminous from afar in the dusk of the warehouse. Left among empty factories on the edge of the city, just the two of us work here in this metal labyrinth, where aisles of skeletal shelves the colour of battleships go on forever. Above us, the buzzing fluorescent suns on the corrugated ceiling bleach her skin. Together, we are neglected by the managers in a distant office block and avoided by the drivers who come for packages. Square mountains of boxes that we pack, seal, stack, and then stuff into the lorry that is parked inside the giant rollers at the end of the day. As I watch Saul sleep un until the, the afternoon period, when her shuffling under the weight of boxes begins again, I fancy I could run away, but he makes sounds like gas escaping whenever I stray far. Through those sticky lids I think you can see me. That doesn't really give a sense of the, um, the the nature of the story so far but I love the exiled like a degenerate king on a cardboard of throne. Saul sleeps down here in the gloom. That's a brilliant opening. Anyway, this story, it's hard to put into words. This feels more properly weird with a capital W than the other stories. I almost got like King vibes, not to say that I've, I've, okay, I've not actually read any King, I have a preconceived notion of what King is like, maybe a little bit standard horror, maybe that's utter blasphemy, but you know, to take that as it is, um, but anyway, this, this feels much more like proper weird fiction, um, and it's just this strange account of this person who is sort of inveigled in this household and in, in this strange I get the sense of a sort of rural environment. If you've ever seen this is gonna be a weird reference for anyone that's not familiar with it with it, but if you've ever watched Courage the Cowardly Dog, it feels like that as a um in terms of where this sort of house is situated and the feeling that I got from it anyway. Very weird. This man who is uh who has a friend who the um Basically, he, th this guy is living with um, his co-worker Saul, um, and he's sort of paying rent to the uh, to Saul's mother um, in a sort of separate house. But there's two houses beside each other, and Saul and him, uh, the, the protagonist, and Saul's brother live in the same house. Um, and let's just say there's a, the whole conceit is that there's something to do with milk, and the the protagonist goes through this transformation where. We learn that uh, he gradually becomes almost trapped in a way because he's partaken of this milk, and it is extremely weird. There's a lot of slug imagery. There's sort of fatness and corpulent characters, and uh, it's just like whiteness, and um, it feels very grotesque, and, and it's it's brilliantly executed. It's it's yellow teeth. It's actually perhaps my favourite story by far um, I was waxing lyrical there about Mother's Milk but Yellow Teeth completely forgot sort of um, overshadowed that a little bit Yellow Teeth is brilliant uh, this is perhaps my favourite story this is this ex excellent um, examination into sort of parasitism and uh, degeneracy and degradation um, it's of it's this this one actually I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you the first two I just did not get along with I've noticed that I really when I when I struggled to get into a story I really struggled to get into a story I just I almost found it a, ch a chore to read some from the very first page I can feel oh I'm not gonna I just don't get this or I just don't feel connected to the theme of it Yellow Teeth on the other hand I really felt anger at uh, you in this down and out character that uh, this protagonist is hosting is uh, the sort of so roommate situation. It's just this. This it actually ha it has Shirley Jackson vibes. I can't remember the story. It's one of my favourites though. In the lottery and other stories, I think that's the title. 
where this character is uh, gradually pushed out of his own surroundings, his own environment, and it changes over time. So that this Ewan character, he's this metalhead with long black hair and a sort of scruffly beard with a cap on, and uh, and he's just listening to, I can't remember what it's called, a necroph- necrophile autopsy or something like that. Um, and uh, just he's just laying waste to this house and he's just utterly destroying the this image that the protagonist has uh, built up over the years of his of his house of his personality of every just everything that he likes to keep safe and protected and whatnot. It's just his his whole sort of world is changing because you and this invading principle has sort of come in and changed everything. It just does not seem to give a shit basically what he's what's happening. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be a per- perceptive to the protagonist's sort of irritation about what's happening. And uh, there's something that... It's an interesting uh, element. I, I wrote a story called Degradation, and it's, it feels very similar in a way, that at least the, sort of the ending to the story. Um, there's a sort of apotheosis, apotheosis um, if I can say it correctly, of the character I just loved. It's a really... I just love the conceit of the story where... Uh, I'm hesitant not to give too much away, but the, this Ewan character, he has this sort of almost religious conviction. He's almost like like a zealot, and uh, but but in a sort of in a, in a sort of way that's that's not what you that's not what you'd expect. So obviously, when you think of a zealot, you think of like a priestly, sterile character. Whereas this is the opposite, where he sort of wants to transcend th- through degradation. You know, I love that sort of thing. It's very, it's almost like something I'd write, but this is obviously much better than what I would write. I think um, I just really got invested in this story. Um, I don't want to give too much away other than that, but it's really, it's a brilliant character study. Uh, really, really good. That's Yellow Teeth. But the stench outside the living room was worst of all, almost pulsing from under the door. I went to knock, then pause and loathe myself for this enduring but pathetic display of courtesy. Why well, maintain the charade of playing the perfect host? He had no respect for me, my pri- my privacy, or my possessions. Strangled by an anger that I recognised as unhealthy, I turned away from the living room door. Too enraged to articulate my grievances, to speak to Ewan in a coherent manner, and to appear reasonable, I walked away. Or was it something else? If I'm honest, I now acknowledge that I was also afraid to enter the lounge and to confront him. Uh, it was fear, but not a fear for my own safety. More an emotion similar to wandering th- uh, through a smell of corruption in a wood, and declining to investigate in case some tortured image in the undergrowth was impressed upon the memory. That's brilliant. So that's uh, Yellow Teeth. Um, I'm going to just briefly just talk about the next couple of stories. Um, Pig Thing is about... Uh, for me, I got the sense that it's about racism. It's about this... Um, I'm going to use inv- inv- invading principle again in a, in a different sense. The story is about this uh, this woman who is uh, seems to be in command of a certain force who that that, that is used against um, people of different ethnicities or or origins or immigrants. I suppose you would say. And this story is set in New Zealand. Um, it's about it's really about these people that are supplanting others. Um, and uh, she's not too happy with that, really. Um, and so she's using a certain... S- it's, it's left vague in a way. I, I want to leave it vague. She's using, I believe, a certain... certain force to... Um, to deal with this problem. And it's, it's, it's set in a... It's set in a, an interesting way. Because I wasn't really... I was not at all sure how the story was going to pan out. And really, actually, just, just revisiting this story... I do actually forget that I, I think that the problem with this story is that it starts off being completely different from the, from the latter half or the latter quarter or whatever. So it starts off with these kids um, that are sort of hiding. They're, they're, both of their parents have gone out uh, because they have seen this creature uh, surrounding their, their garden. And it's really about these kids and they're just sort of fearful of, of, of about what, sorry, they're fearful of what's going to happen. Uh, and then they're not sure if their parents are alive or w- what's really happening there. And then it sort of switches, scene break, um, 
and then we get a whole different perspective. And it's really surprising and good in that way. It keeps you on your toes. But then we we finally figure out who what this creature is and what that what that means. And and actually the ending is quite impressing if that's a if that's a way of describing it. It impresses upon you, I suppose, um, in a way that may have perhaps not been so effective um, if it wasn't so stark in terms of its this perspective and in that perspective. You see what I mean? A to B, or this or that. It's 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 quite effective in in that way. I won't dwell on that one too much, but it's a decent story. I didn't really find it that interesting until the end, because I think it really, it kicks off near the, sort of the last quarter. What hath, uh, what God hath wrought? Um, this one, unfortunately, I'll, I say this all the time in my uh, in my reviews, uh, it brilliantly written, quite engaging actually, but for this one I felt it's not my sort of style at all. The way the characters speak, it's a very hard-boiled... Uh, it's an American story. I'm not a fan of those types of stories. So it's, um, I think it's set on the frontier, sort of hard-boiled uh, uh, dragoon, I believe, this trooper. Um, it reminded me of it's like True Grit plus some sort of vampire film. I'll say that much. It's it's actually one of the longer stories, and it really is quite engaging. It's got this this religious element to it. There's New Zion and, and all sorts of stuff. Really, it feels like it could be its own novel. Actually, it's really quite in depth. I just, I just don't really connect with those sort of characters. Uh, so this next story, um, Doll Hands. This is a very interesting one, and I felt very uh, a lot of sympathy for the character, the protagonist. Uh, I, I found some of the world building elements a little bit vague, and I feel like it could have been more defined. Um, for example, we have the world seems to be. The environment seems to be aff afflicted by a sort of mist. Um, there's, there's elements of cannibalism, I'll just say that. I'm not quite sure exactly how, maybe we don't need to be told, and it's not really an, an intrinsic problem, but I don't feel like we've got much detail on how this world be uh, came to be as it is, and how this sort of cityscape is as it is. But we have this protagonist who seems to be a sort of night porter, or, uh, or, night, or a night watchman, I can't, there's actually another story that's linked to this, I, I believe, it's similar names and similar premise and conceit. So I can't remember, I'm, I might be getting the, the occupations of the protagonist mixed up here. But there's this guy who, has, who has seemingly has a, a large head and doll hands, these fragile doll hands. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, I think it's just to do with um, a sort of troubled background and he, he was in a foster home and bullied as well. But also, just generally, the characters in the story, they seem to have strange appearances, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I, I guess it's the weirdness for weirdness sake. I'm not sure. Perhaps I've missed something quite large there. But really, the story centres around this idea of this protagonist. He's not quite at home in the surroundings. I want to try and be quite vague about this one. There are these two caterers that come in, and they have these things in sacks, um... I'm not going to say what, what that is, really. Um, and he feels dreadful about what what what, what happens uh, with with these carers that come in, and what 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 he has to basically serve um, the sort of the people in the upper echelons of this. I, think, I can't remember if it's a lodge or not. Apologies for all these vague details, but um, it's a sort of lodge that this he's working in this lodge basically. And he always has to go up and check on the the the, the people in the in these in these rooms. And there, there are particularly snooty people in there as well. It's a very strange saying, though. Um, <coughs> and I won't say much more than that, really, other than the fact that uh, I actually did feel quite a lot of sympathy for the end, where uh, for for the uh, at the end with the character, because he really he seems to be the only one that really understands the situation, and uh, <coughs> he takes he uh, takes this retributive action at the end. Um, and I really felt it actually quite quite good because it's it, it seems to get revenge on on a particular character at the end. I'll just say that doll hands. It's a it's a weird one. It, it almost reminded me of one of Lagotti's stories where it's uh, set in a strange town. And I say that because um, the next story actually it's the very next story. Apologies for the pause there. I was looking to see if it was the a couple of stories down. It's not. It's the next story to to forget and be forgotten. So this next story, to forget and be forgotten, it seems to have it seems to share certain similarities with the last story, um, Doll Hands. 
that's mostly in the fact that the name of this building sort of like a suite, this sort of grand suite or hotel or lodge it's very similar, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's in Zurenberg in Antwerp um, it's very similar it's called, in, the, in to forget and be forgotten, it's called Dul Griet Huis pronounced, uh, butchered the pronunciation there of course and it's called something very similar in this, in this other story. I wasn't quite sure that it was actually going to be connected, these two stories, but it seems to be the case because although it starts different, at the end it seems very familiar. Um, so I really enjoyed this, the start of this story. Uh, it feels very Ligotian. It's about this person who seems to want quiet and silence. And uh, he, he talks about this profound need for profound isolation. And he's specifically chosen this job as a night watchman. So they can just read and just um, just be uh, himself and just not have to deal with people. Very Lagotian in that sense. Um, almost, almost, almost had Stillville vibes to it as well from Cisco in a, in a sense. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that bit. Just very introspective. And then, unfortunately for me, the story fell flat because it. it <sighs> Uh, okay, I'm going to give spoilers for this one, so you can probably skip ahead. We have some uh, old women in this. Uh, it actually seems to have that element quite a lot in this, in, in this collection, especially for the very first story as well. Um, there's, there's some old women, there's creepy old women, there's an entourage of uh, old women in this, in this sort of lodge, this hotel. They're actually quite creepy, quite genuinely creepy imagery of them crawling on all fours and having sort of translucent skin and stuff. It's pretty creepy. But um, I felt like it fell flat because it went from this introspective story where it felt very sort of intellectual and there was a lot of subtext and stuff. But then it, it just sort of turned into this horror story. It almost felt like The Shining or something. That's probably high praise, actually. But uh, it, felt, it just felt more like this creepiness for creepiness's sake. And... Uh, Eventually, it just it just evolves into chasing uh, some old women around the, the the building and this sort of coming upon this ritual where they're all sort of dancing in a circle and there's a, there's this sort of a patriarch in a bed with some horns on his head. I just didn't. I felt like it was completely it's like a botched ending, unfortunately, for how good the start was. Um, maybe I missed something, but uh, yeah, I just did not find it particularly. Um, I just felt like it was sort of like a wasted ending, really. Just didn't really see how it connected. Um, but actually, the I'll say I completely forgot about this, this aspect to it. There's an end, the, the ending of the last story, Doll Hands, features an old woman with a sort of beakish face, and uh, and there's actually a lot of similar imagery here as well with this sort of beakish old woman, and it's uh, it seems like it's quite sort of connected. It must be. Actually, I should say the uh, the last story I believe is even set in the future, so it almost seems like a future. Ver so this story, to, to forget and be forgotten, seems almost like a future version of the. Oh, sorry, uh, an older version of the last story, of the first story, Doll Hands. I just got some sort of similarities, some, some similar vibes and imagery, and, and even setting structures and uh, words cho word choices. So I'm not sure if those are connected or not. The ancestors. Um, I'll be a little bit brief on this one. I believe this is sort of a more Japanese folklore. It, it adds a lot of good variety to the collection. Nothing like it in the collection. Uh, really good. It's just... Um, it's this story about... Uh, this... I think it's this, this boy... I actually can't remember the, if the gender is specified or not. I think it's this, this boy who, who has a sort of imaginary friend, or perhaps not so imaginary. Uh, almost give me, gives me vibes of... Uh, the, the the creature that comes out of the TV in the ring, I think it is. Sort of long black hair and sort of pale face. Um, the, this sort of imaginary friend that, that, that he has. And uh, it's, this, it's this, this element of children not wanting to be parted from their, their surroundings. Um, that's what I got from it anyway. I think I'll leave it at that. It's a shorter one and uh, but there's a real sense, there's a, cer there's a certain sense of melancholy that's not there in the other stories. It, it feels very, uh, this is Japanese folklore, sort of rainy, misty day, um, 
almost like it's almost an element of of, of it's like it's almost more like a ghost story. I'll say that like, like a tra traditional ghost story in a way, and the ending is quite evocative as well. The Age of Entitlement. I got a sense from this one that uh, it really almost it feels like a Camus story to me. It feels like the plague, if you've read that. Um, the Age of Entitlement, the Age of Enlightenment. Um, this story is about uh, again the world building is vague, but in a, I actually think it's effective in that sense because we're not. We, it seems to be that civilization has sort of run its course, and there's sort of a, a malaise that sort of seems to seems to have inflicted upon on Paris and uh, America and the UK, the, the three main sort of countries that are mentioned. Um, where where things are just hap things things are just sort of running on and it's a lot of people se seemingly people have died and but there's still uh it's almost it's quite creepy actually there's quite unsettling there's uh it seems to be this black ocean that seems to be sort of spreading over everything and there seems it seems to be this blackness I'm not it seems quite vague maybe I, again maybe I've missed some sort of specific element that's actually that explains why this is happening but uh it, I, I quite enjoyed that it was quite vague in that sense because. It's, it's almost not about that actually. It's more about this two, these, this interaction between two two figures, the, the protagonist and this uh, this friend. Again, there's, there's actually repeating elements in this short story collection where this friend is not perceptive to the protagonist's um, inner life. I suppose. What I mean by that is that um, whereas uh, the old thief was more about how how Ewan uh, is just crashing on the place and just d doesn't really give a shit about what's, what he's doing to his friend's home and his environment. This one is more about the friend, I can't apologize, I can't, uh, the name doesn't really matter, but the, the friend of this protagonist, uh, he, he seems to always want things from the protagonist. He's very entitled, the, the age of entitlement, and uh, we learn um, after the fact, is I think it, I think it would have been better to have the scene um, where we where we're shown this revelation. You you know what I mean if you've read the story, but it comes after the fact and it doesn't feel as impactful. But we learn that uh, I'll try and keep it vague. But we learn that perhaps this character shouldn't be so entitled um, for very good reasons. And uh, there's this creeping sense of dis despisement, if that's a word. You'd, just like Ewan, just like the protagonist despises Ewan in the Yellow Teeth, the protagonist in the Age of Entitlement also despises his friend as well. It seems to it's like a creeping feeling of this uh, this hatred toward his friend who was never really a friend, um, and it's just it's this little, this little character study in this strange environment where uh, this this uh, the protagonist is always having to buy things and he's always having to do everything, and then the uh, the protagonist, the sorry, the friend, just doesn't really respond to that. He doesn't really repay with kindness, and doesn't doesn't really react in that sense. Um, so that's the age of entitlement. It's a weird one. It's it feels it feels like the plague. If you've read the, read the plague, it feels like something from Camus. Probably just, I may just be saying that because it's set in Paris and it's uh, it has an element of sort of abandonment. It feels very. This one is very literary and it's very cerebral and slow and introspective. It's a good one. Uh, I quite enjoyed how the, how the story ends up as well. So this next, this last story, Flory, uh, very Shirley Jackson-esque again. It's uh, a story of transformation set in just as a very domestic s setting. Um, where this character Frank, he's very sure of himself and he has his own sort of, he's a bachelor, he, um, he's a professional, he's very stylish and modern and sleek and he wants to set up a new house, he's just bought a new house and he wants to set up in a very modern way, very much the antithesis of what I would like in a house actually, so that's probably why I enjoyed the story actually, very modern and sleek and modernist. Um, and I, I won't I won't spoil it too much other than to say he almost becomes the opposite of that. And I really I enjoyed the way I really enjoyed the way that it's shown and presented. We're sh we're shown rather than really told 
about uh, the char- the character of Frank's progression from from his original state to his latter state, his, ne- his next stage in his growth, um, even to the point where his friend Marcus is saying he's confused about how he's acting, Frank, how Frank is acting. Um, I won't say too much because it's, 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 there's not much more to it than that, but I, I've really enjoyed the way that uh, for, for lots of really concrete details, a lot of, it feels, I love these stories that just have, we talk about like, we talk about uh, the corner shop, talk about ITV and listening to the radio and the smells of, it's very, it's a very nostalgic story, there's lots and lots of details here, um, buying at specific meals and all sorts, and you get the sense that he's, because of a previous occupant, I'll say that, because of a previous occupant, he is, uh, seems to be changing. So thanks for watching everyone. I probably will be doing, uh, I'm getting into the flow of reviews again, so I probably will be doing, I think I'll probably revisit the masterful novella, um, Mervyn Peake's Boy in Darkness, which is one of my favourites. So anyway, that was Old and Word Books, back on YouTube again. Um, thanks for watching. Cheers.